Well, good evening, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to Harrisburg City Council Legislative Session. Today is Tuesday, July 3rd, 2018. I'm calling this meeting to order at 615. Mr. Petrosky, please do the roll call. Mr. Allen. Present. Ms. Daniels. Here. Ms. Green. Present. Mr. Johnson. Here. Mr. Madsen. Here. Mr. Majors. Here. Ms. Williams. Present. Thank you, Mr. Petrosky. Moving on to the invocation, Mr. Johnson. Um, I would like to take a moment of silence um, for the children who are in Thailand. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Moving on to Pledge of Allegiance, Ms. Green. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Ms. Green. Moving on to communications, but before we do that, we would like for Mr. Grover to speak on the Act 47, where we are with that, and the July 9th report, saying that we have 15 days to formally comment on that report. Mr. Grover. Thank, thank you, Madam President. Um, it is July 9th, which is next Monday, is the time for the coordinator to submit a formal plan proposed for the exit of Act 47. Um, there's been a couple presentations on this already. Um, I had asked uh, the Madam President to at least speak to this for a moment because it's a 15-day window is a very limited time. Um, it is the time to actually make formal comments. Uh, if uh, the coordinator can only recommend things that are in the law, that's just in the statute. She can't say the law should change. A coordinator can only recommend what's in the law. We've been down this road and know there's very few things in the law. but. Uh, if the council or any council member in particular wants to comment and differ from what is in a plan, and I'm not positive what will be in the plan when it comes, if you don't take the opportunity when there's a formal comment period and you later try to go back to Judge Ledbetter on the other side of this, you will not have made the record you had the opportunity to make to say that there is another way or other ways or other options. So it's an important window in time that really does a lot of things hinge on. And uh, I, the report may not need much comment or it may need lots of comment, but I just, I, I just need counsel to be aware that's coming, it's gonna happen very fast and it'll be over very fast. And there'll be a hearing in these chambers before the end of July with the coordinator on that report. If there are not comments, regardless of what that says, that's the, that is the recommended report that most likely comes out of the coordinator. So this is the opportunity to have her change it before one comes back for a vote in September. Okay. Neil, just for clarification, so there's a 15-day window after July 9th, so would that by all, we're finding business days, or is that by July 24th? I think it's July 24th, okay. so. Okay. Is, is, is there any way that we know, where can we, uh, for the people who are watching, mm -hmm. um, where can we reference them to make a public comment once the um, document is available? Um, here, but how, I don't know, on the website, you know, on paper, on any way they can. But uh, what's formally going to happen is it's going to be delivered to the clerk's office as mm -hmm. the formal filing by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania of the report and the recommendation. It will be available for inspection there. It will obviously be put up immediately online. Um, and I, I, I would assume that we're going to, with Ryan, work out a public comment place to put it on the, on the screen for that. Um, but And there's the hearing. And there's the hearing where they can speak at. Yeah, but yes. usually the hearings are at times where people. No, uh, the hearing is July 24th here in city council chambers at 530. Yeah. So. But if, if we can definitely put something up online, even if someone can like submit something and maybe we can <coughs> kind of generalize it. I mean, not generalize, change their comment, but I think it'll be nice to have something where we can reference and share um, for those who can't make the public hearing. From the public. Agreed. You can. Okay. 
Okay. Any questions, council members? Okay, thank you, Mr. Grover. Moving on to communication, the presentation from Mark Woolley, who is our business administrator. Administrator, Mr. Woolley. Okay. Here you go. Man. Let's see. Oh. Let me put my bifocus on. Okay. Right. Good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, Madam President and members of council. Uh, as promised, uh, I'm back uh, with a report and update on uh, the disadvantaged certified business assessment. Um, I'm with me. Uh, is Hillary Green, Charles White, and Trishon Dial. Um, these are the people that are helping me uh, collate a lot of the manual information um, and data from our mainframe about the, uh, the spend over the past three years. Uh, in addition, uh, they are responsible for outreach and changing some of the protocols that are um, uh, of concern. Uh, in addition, my apologies for the printed copies because page three see. didn't show yeah. up very well because of the yeah. background. You'll see that it's a dark background. We used uh, white lettering and the printing just didn't work, but yeah. you'll, you'll have those numbers. Um, also, I've met with um, uh, Impact Harrisburg Board, board uh, and kind of laid out uh, our plan of action uh, to increase participation rates. Um, they were receptive, um, and we're, we're working towards com uh, continual communication and see how um, what our once we are finished our analysis, where our um, where we may need help and where they can be helpful. So, with that, um, really going to turn this over to um, the group here, so that we can go over some of the. Um, uh, the changes that we're implementing, some of the outreach, and then we'll go over the numbers too. Uh, with that, um, Shoshan, I think you're up. So just to review, good evening. Good evening. City Council. Uh, assessment objectives, so we formally began this process in December of 2017, and so some of our big questions were we needed to define who we were serving, define the city of Harrisburg's process, uh, define what would be the benefits for businesses specifically who became vendors and made it onto our directories. And so we looked at everything that was consistently being done and inconsistently being done, uh, such as inclusion of email blasts, bid notifications, invitations to pre-bid conferences, invitations to meet and greet, uh, specifically trying to build rapport and relationships between primes and subs, invitations to specific workshops and also to define monitoring and the accountability processes. Also a very quick review, uh, and this was the way that our assessment team really looked at this because it's so big, is three very different goals. Uh, of course, we would love to be able to address all three of them, um, but that would require more human resources and monetary resources. But just to review again, one goal of business certification uh, is that it's a collection tool, simply a data collection tool. How many businesses are in a specific, specific region, what types of businesses, etc. And that's on a local, state, and national level. A second goal for certified businesses would be actual business development. And that can run the gamut from someone who is interested in starting a business, who doesn't even have an LLC or a partnership or anything, all the way to those um, who would lead to the third goal, which would really be business elevation. So they are already have a business, they've got vision, mission, they've got documents, but they actually want to climb up within whatever industry or field they're in. So three very specific goals. So I'll turn this over to my colleague, Hillary Green. Hi. Hi. Good evening. So um, you asked us to look into previous um, year spend um, with regard to minority and disadvantaged business enterprises. So. I gathered together um, that data as best I could with um, utilizing the resources that I had to do that. Um, over the past three years, 
um, the, the city has spent approximately $25 million on just goods and services. Um, of that, $3.8 million was approximately spent on my, with minority or disadvantaged, disadvantaged business enterprises. Um, secondly, uh, with regard to construction and engineering type services, um, we spent over three years about $3 million, and of that 646 was spent with uh, minority businesses. Now keep in mind, um, this didn't bring in project specific spends, this is just what the city has spent um, in total in those categories. Uh, we did eliminate a number of categories um, from the calculation. Uh, you will see in the second box there, we um, separated out utilities and telecom, insurance type products, financial products, that would be like uh, banking, financing products, and then also um, we, we have a program that is used to fuel our fleet, and that's the WEX uh, bank program. So I've taken those out because those are largely corporations or publicly traded companies um, that we don't have insight into that information. So sticking just to the goods and services, um, largely using either locally owned businesses that you know of or regional businesses, um, some national, and then engineering and construction services, um, you'll not notice there that we've spent 15% um, with with um, minority businesses. And then I've broken that ad down additionally into categories. Um, as much as we know, uh, you can see how much we spent with women-owned businesses, minority, and then the other were undisclosed um, categorized in different ways. Um, I will note that we are going to continue to try to reorganize how we capture this on an ongoing basis. So um, with regard to purchasing and processing payments for vendors, we do actually have to um, readjust how we capture this information so that we can capture it within the accounting system. Currently it is not captured there and we also don't have categories broken down. Um, using our accounting system. So a, a good amount of work would have to be done in order to break that information down and capture that moving forward. But I think we can do it for sure. Uh, Hillary, excuse me. Uh, uh -huh. Mr. Johnson has a question since he could not see up I'm on sorry, the board. Yeah, I'm sorry. We I'm can't sorry. see the percentages. Enough. Okay. But, so you're saying, so that last block, that's where it has like the breakdown. Are you saying like the MB, DB? Right. And right. what are those percentages right there you're reading? Sure. You're reading so of the spend, um, the total spend of three in three years of four million with minority or disadvantaged businesses, seventy-three percent is what we consider a DBE, mm -hmm. where we don't know specifically. Um, the MBE spend was twelve percent, and the WBE spend was thirteen percent. And is, is there a? Um, because then I can calculate another percent, but there's there's an actual dollar amount there. So yeah. I think I think the bigger number, I think you know that's where percentages are interesting. I think what people usually cross reference percentages against would be um, the total spend versus those different groups. You see what I'm saying? Rather than breaking them down in between the in total. Right now we're looking at it from a total pie. You see what I'm saying? Of saying like, mm -hmm. um, you know, our total DB is 15 percent, but then we're breaking it down to another pie of saying out of that. 15% within this 100% pie, 75 is spent this way. A lot of times, like when you, like I, what I've seen other cities do, is they'll take like that total spend, and then they'll break it down into different categories. Basically, um, that 15% is broken up into those percentages. You see what I'm saying? Well, we did that. You can see the the spend is actually 4.4 .4 million dollars. Mm -hmm. And so what we did is we went those that were identified and certified. Um, and we knew that they were MBE or WBE, we were able to assign them. The others that were DBE that were not disclosed other than DBE, that represents about 74%. So that would, would, would enable, that would require us if we were to break that 74% down to actually call each vendor and ask them what their, um, what, what the disadvantaged group they belong to. Mm -hmm. that, I understand what you're saying, but right. so, so like what I've seen, so like if we're looking at it, um, so 
some places they'll look at it and kind of say like, all right, hey, this is our this is our total spend, mm -hmm. right? And then you can either assign a goal for just DBEs in general, or sometimes people will say like, all right, this is our total spend. This is our goal for um, MB, MB. These are our goal for W. You see what I'm saying? Where where those individual percentages are looked at at by the total spend. So, so what we did here, and I'm not saying, it, you, you can easily calculate it based upon the dollar figure that's there between how much was spent with a minority business in, in, regardless, in regard to the total spend of what was spent, period. But I think, I, think what, I think what can be deceiving, not deceiving, I mean, if you just look at it real quick, when you break it down to that entirely new different pie of kind of saying within that 15%, within this new 100% pie, this is the breakdown of it. And I understand. Well, that, that, no, the whole pie is there. So yeah. you have, if you take the total spend, which would be approximately $39 million, um, if you include utilities, and you know, so mm -hmm. the spend over that three year period was about $39, $39 million. And so if you want to back those numbers in, then you'll look at the DBE spend for that, it would be about 12%. Mm -hmm. Um, for if you take all the spend. But the ones we removed really are, you know, they would be difficult for a I understand disadvantage. Yeah, yeah, so that new number. Right. What is that? That new number is what, like? 28. 28 almost million. 29. Mm -hmm. And of that spend, 15%, almost 15.5% is with a DBE. And then of that 15%, the, what we were able to calculate because we wanted to make sure that we're, we broke down that 15%. The only ones that we were able to capture and they had self either self-reported or had been certified of MBE were 12% and WB were about 14%. 74% is just undisclosed and it's just labeled DBE. For us to be able to, we actually, and I, we just said we have to actually call each vendor and ask them what disadvantage group they belong to. But going forward, we're using seamless stock app application, and then people can self disclose on them. We have the ability and the option for them to self disclose if they want to go further than DBE. Mm -hmm. So, what if they don't self disclose? Then it's, it, then it's considered, it is con considered then it's, okay. So, you still won't get an accurate number if they don't do that. Right. Okay. We think with the way we sort of proposed the form or started capturing it by the form, we think we can, I mean, it's in their interest to, you know, fill out the form completely. If they have questions, they can call us, but we think it will probably take a few months, probably four months or so to get all of our current vendors sort of registered through that mm -hmm. new form. And then that way we can really capture with more certainty, you know, what those numbers really may be. Mm -hmm. And then we could re-report out on 2018 where we are so far. So far, the, those, those that have, have self-reported have drilled down on the, on the forms. I think I've signed 15 or so. Uh, probably the most 10. Yeah. 10, 10, 10. Okay. And re the reason why I'm asking the question, I'm kind of saying like a, as far as like the number, um, looking at the, the pies in it, because, you know, like are we, as we're moving forward and we're looking towards like possibly, I'm just speaking, um, possibly setting goals. Is it is it from a is it from a parameter where we're looking at, you know, spend with DBEs or we're looking at these different categories that live within DBEs? I, I, it really depends on on the vendors and their their what they have one wanted to be certified as and what they want to self disclose. So. It's sort of dependent on the vendors on those. Um, but the goals, we can set goals, but we're going to have to have the, the caveat that some folks will not self disclose further than DBE. Well, that's nice. So, are we relying on the federally designated criteria for like a DBE, MBE, or our own? Because I know, like, for instance, like in the feds would say, like, 51% stake. Um, you know, 1.32 in net revenue to kind of get that small business designation. So are we relying on those designations or are we setting additional criteria? I think that's in combination to what he's kind of asking. Uh, holistically, we probably need to look at all, at least all of the, the subsets mm -hmm. um, and probably determine based on the project what percentage would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Um, I mean, that's just my, my thought process. Because I know, I mean, it wouldn't, and I realize some of the difficulties with the designations would be how they would self-report anyway. Yeah, like and one the of the things is, it could cover, I, covers a lot of ground. And it does, right. and, but one of the things I think we touched on last time is that uh, DOT doesn't make that designation. So uh, even when you're going on to go through the certification process, they're not identifying you as a, a woman-owned business, a minority-owned business. Right, they're just focusing on DVD. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you're disadvantaged regardless because you're in that group. Correct. You're in that socially economic disadvantaged group. And we were given background on that because we asked. And they said when they did use to break down DVDs into WDEs and NDEs, that actually furthered discrimination mm -hmm. because someone could say, I don't want to work with NBEs, I only want to work with WBEs, so they could look on the letter and go, oh, this is a WBE, I don't want to work with them, or vice versa. Mm -hmm. So there's no way we can get that information unless we go on site, right. which our recommendation, I believe, as a group would be that's something we should contract out mm -hmm. because none of us have that exact subject matter expertise, and that would be a full-time job in itself. Right, well, that's also... To go out to sites and monitor or call people and say, are you an LGBTBE, a service-disabled veteran, mm -hmm. a dis disability-owned business? We have to ask that. And the, and the, and the difference word. is self-reporting versus how they would, you know, you know what I mean? Because that comes to the identification piece. Because I do know even within, if, like, even if you get as far as looking at EOC classification, some people don't self-report based on that, based on what they, you know, would rather perceive it to be um, over time. So I think that's, it is, it is tricky in terms of how you set the parameters. And we are using third-party certifiers as well. So we took ourselves out of that game. We are not certifying any businesses. And that is up on our website as well. Uh, we model okay. our website That's after good. the CRW website. Mm -hmm. So there are absolutely third-party national certifiers, and that's who we refer individuals to. And all of them give pretty good you know, hand-holding yep. services. Okay. And just even going through this process to identify minority businesses, they, it's one of these things if it's not visible, then we have to make that call or we have to make the contact. And then at the same time, are you willing to disclose that information on the other end to right. whoever you're talking to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I had some bad experiences calling some people. Um, you know, if you're not with the census and generally, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, generally that's when you give up that information. But if yeah. you just call somebody and you're saying, hey, is this your company? And are you a minority business? They're like, well, why do you need this information? So uh, that's just some of the obstacles we, at least we ran across when we're trying to, to verify. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so I guess I'll pick up here is the, uh, the engagement uh, piece of it, and, and some of you probably already seen, uh, is the uh, starting growing your business uh, brochure. We updated that information to include um, everything that is, uh, is current as far as telephone numbers, and then as far as the services that we're providing. Um, I continue to do the um, business group meetings, uh, try to establish one in Allison Hill, and then I'm, I'm also looking at Uptown to try to get the business group meetings going. I need to hit the street here probably in the next um, couple weeks to try to get something going up there. Um, we also uh, had an event which some members did attend. That was June 1st, uh, which turned out pretty well as far as the attendance. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 65 people at least that signed up on the uh, sign-in sheet. Uh, what I'm, I'm under the impression it was over 100 that attended uh, throughout the day. Um, <coughs> but at least from there we already received some feedback as far as some of the vendors that showed up. Uh, you know, at least establishing relationships and I think that's the most important part is the establishment of a relationship so you can get on to more opportunities. Uh, and then from there, we also, um, myself, Shashan, and Jackie, uh, participated in a shared event, uh, which is held. Uh, it, it originated in Pittsburgh, and, but what it is is a networking, uh, matchmaking opportunity. So they send you um, uh, companies that register and already do business with government entities, mm -hmm. and you're provided with their information, and then you set up uh, interview like 15 minute interview sessions with them. So uh, from there, a lot of the individuals that we met with, at least the 10 that we met with, I know five of them had already registered on our seamless docs uh, process. So we do have their information available uh, as well. And part of what Mark touched on was the, the uh, seamless docs preparation. So we're trying to move away from uh, the directory. I did update the directory to put 
some additional uh, uh, companies on there and then remove those that weren't uh, no longer in business. Um, but the, the thought process is, is to get, uh, it, get it where an individual fills out the seamless doc application online, mm -hmm. and then that is actually put online and is and made available once we go through the approval process. So then that way it's out there for everybody to see. And this goes for all vendors, it's just not minority vendors. So we just set it up so you can go on there and you will have that designation if you are looking for minority or woman owned business. Okay, thank you. Uh, we also had meetings with some of the chambers and we discussed some of our uh, other events. We plan to have continual events um, with CRW, with the African American Chamber of Commerce, um, with Credic. So hopefully those will be coming up here in the next couple of weeks as well. So you're looking for partnerships with the African American Chamber? What's that? You're looking for partnerships with the African American Chamber? Okay. Well, yeah, and I think we partner with all the, the entities. It's, it's, it's figuring out when we're doing um, uh, seminars or doing workshops, we're just mm -hmm. trying to figure out what, what best um, ways to utilize each each organization. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we continue to provide assistance. Um, I know uh, Shoshana and myself, we, we get a lot of walk-ins uh, from time to time, at least um, inquiries into this process. So um, I know within the last couple of months, we saw several individuals at least help them develop their business and, and get some things in order. Uh, we also participated in the ADA pre-assessment um, meeting where it was a lot of um, uh, members of the administration that were there to discuss ways of how to, to implement the ADA process. Mm -hmm. uh, we're continuing to network in, in the community um, and also meeting individuals that could possibly affect our numbers and help us and assist, what, uh, assist the city as far as getting on to, on to projects. Uh, some of the information Again, that we changed is on the website um, as far as the MBE section and removing ourselves from uh, actually being a certifying uh, agency. So what we do is we direct individuals to those third party agencies and then we also provide them that assistance with establishing uh, their business. So if they don't have a, um, if they haven't made the designation as far as getting their articles, as far as getting uh, their fictitious name together, uh, we assist them with that, and I think a lot of the information is available through the, the pamphlet and through the brochure uh, that we have available. Uh, and also, uh, I think most of you should have received the uh, good faith form uh, that was put together uh, as well, and then we also have business referral forms. So uh, one of the things that um, you know, um, myself and Jackie, we came up with was uh, when individuals come in, we don't have that necessarily that follow through. So when we come in and we, we provide a referral to maybe Community First Fund or, um, you know, some of these other agencies out here that can offer assistance, uh, the, the follow through part of it wasn't wasn't there. So meaning they may have got, gotten lost into the tracks or maybe when they got there, they didn't get the service that they, that they needed. Uh, so what we do now is when an individual comes in, we identify uh, some of the things that they need. We send it to uh, our partner agencies with a referral form, and then we um, tell them at least to put down the information that, um, you know, we feel is vital as far as what service mm -hmm. that they provided to them. And do we have any questions? Any questions, Councilman? Ms. Green? No, I don't have any questions. Mr. Madsen? Uh, not at this time, thank you. Mr. Johnson? Oh, he always sets me up to look the bad guy. All the questions. Um, so as far as, like, I, we're on the website, you were saying um, people just fill out vendor forms. That's the same as the stock that we have now, right? Yeah. So then through that vendor form, is that where like if I was a, a vendor where I would kind of self-certify myself as? Okay. Well, you're not, you wouldn't be self-certifying. You can still be a vendor, um, but what we request is we, if you have certification, so if you have a disadvantage certification, minority business certification, uh, if you're a general contractor, we ask that you put that information up there. Uh -huh. um, you can scan it in 
and then upload the document on there, and then you fill out the W-9. From there, um, that information is, is sent to me, and then I verify the address. If, they're, if they list on there that they're a minority uh, vendor um, and they don't have the certification uh, document on there, I, I decline it, I send them an email, and tell them to upload that information on there. Once, oh, okay. once that information is put on the system, then it's sent to uh, Mark for another review, and then he makes the uh, final final approval. So from there, we that the seamless uh, docs isn't part of our um, internal system. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to figure out a way to, to implement it onto our uh, website. Make okay. that. So basically, all then any vendor, any vendor, any vendor. Yep. So is so because I know like I'm on the website now. So on the vendor thing, it's listed under like MB. DB, like as a vendor, but is it listed in there like our starting, like doing business in the city of Harrisburg where it's the same vendor form? I didn't, I didn't look yet. You well, I mean, it, it should be because it's the same. It, it would be, be the, the same. same. Yeah, it's the same process. We're not, we don't want to change the process okay. from even if you want to be a vendor, you're still filling out the same information. Mm -hmm. We just have additional boxes on there for you to indicate if you do have a certification. Exactly. So, as a, so just, just as far as it's like, City vendors, what do we what do we do with that internally? Like collecting anyone outside of where we can put on an additional list. You see what I'm saying? Because yeah. it seems like we're taking that information, you have your certification, then you're on this, then you possibly get added to our directory. Yeah. If I'm just a vendor that doesn't qualify for the directory, what, what happens to that? No, you would you would still qualify. So yeah. you would we would um, host every vendor, but then you could see who was a minority or certified in. You know the various. It would almost provide like a, a link to them, so you would have a name, you would have their address, and then another column with the designation that they had a designation. There. Okay. Yeah, and so then that way you could click on that that information, you could see if it's if it's available, and, that, and that, it puts the onus back on the individual too to update their information mm -hmm. um, because we have a lot of uh, different uh, word documents as far as um, vendor tracking. So it will help us, at least internally, um, you know, keep a track of vendors. And then, um, you know, we can, from there, uh, send out solicitations, send out notices, and, you know, get those blasts out. And we're saying this vendor list is something that's going to be a public document as well. Because mm -hmm. this is something new. We never had a vendor list that's mm -hmm. public before. That's correct, yes. That's what we're saying. Yes. So that's, yes. a, that's the change in the model yeah. that we're yes. going for. And right now, with how Seamless Docs works, um, they're working on a workaround so we can extract the data from the um, submissions and make that public. Because um, how their, their format works is that they post, we can post publicly when your actual application, where it is in the process of being approved, but um, we actually want the final vendor list to be mm -hmm. posted. So we're working with them to sort of extract that data and then make it in, into a format that we can make public and that people can use that, whether you're a city agency or um, a local developer, you mm -hmm. can use that list then to reach out to those different um, mm -hmm. you know, businesses. And then hopefully, I'm hoping too, I can get the subcategories in there, but it depends how much room we have. Um, but you can hopefully, potentially export and sort if you need to so okay. um, right now we can do that capability it just goes to an excel spreadsheet so mm -hmm. it would basically be the same thing that we you know have now floating around mm -hmm. so we wanted to make it more, more like a user. database yes. yeah yeah we're trying to make it into a tool mm -hmm. that, get away from paper. that people can use yeah. so the idea is to push of if someone's interested in doing business business yes you know you will fill out this vendor mm -hmm. you, vendor form on that vendor form mm -hmm. you can then if you have any additional certification, can list your certification so you have a complete mm -hmm. vendor form. That's mm -hmm. correct. The idea of collecting the database. So if I wanted to right. so sort through and kind of just look for maybe a DB or, or MB, I can just really process me just do a sort through the database. But if I just really want to do any pool of, ve of, of vendors for any type of work mm -hmm. um, from a city list, that will be available online. That's correct. Yeah. All right, so I understand. Yeah. All right, that's and, why I and right now we're working through some of the, the kinks with how we first set up the form. So as soon as we get the form finalized in the best format that will work for to reach all of these goals, we'll then give it to everyone so that you know the the departments can reach their vendors and we can start doing a push out to get folks to to register that way. So then the next question has to do with um, now we're at the step of kind of having like a 
foundation of understanding like where we're at as far as spend and um, percentages within um, different groups. Mm -hmm. um, what do you foresee being the next steps? For me, it's, it's really um, sitting down with council and the administration to set uh, what is our priorities and to set um, goals um, and to really use um, the analysis and the information that we have to better um, formulate what the goal should be. And I think these, and depending on the industry, I don't think it's a one size fits all in terms of, and that this is me personally, I don't think it's a one size fits all. I don't think that in every industry you can have you know, a, a goal of X percentage because there may not be um, the percentages of participation in a given area in a given field. So you have to look at each of those and then set your goals accordingly. So that's going to be a, a conversation, an in-depth conversation with the administration and um, council as to what the appropriate levels should be. Yeah, I know that kind of ties into uh, when it goes to kind of really setting those goals, uh, whether if it calls for us to have to do some type of study or not. And I know the state's coming out with their study in, in August. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the questions that I asked in regards to their study is the implication of, of how can you know, local municipalities apply it, apply it, which right now they're just keep looking at Commonwealth services, so it's, there's no direct application to what they're putting out. Um, but I think um, one of the, um, I forgot the guy's name, but one of the things that they're looking to do possibly is to give um, guidance to local municipalities on um, what they can possibly extract from the study to kind of be a base for if we were to have to do our own study of what information we could possibly use. So that could be, that could be helpful. Because I think um, probably from a legal perspective, we probably have to have some type of justification to kind of have a grant of grounds to kind of assert, I mean, I guess goals are goals, but to write, really have almost what we can well, tell. Well, it's, 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 it's the devil's in the details mm -hmm. and how we define things and what, um, what measures we use to to, once we have the data, yeah. to, to then contract with certain data. So we'll, we'll, we're relying on council to help us uh, kind of navigate that as well. All right, I'm done. Thank you. Hi, Ms. Daniels. No, thank you. Mr. Majors. Uh, no, no questions. Um, well, hold on. Now. So I do have one question. I apologize. So this is just for the services from the city of Harrisburg. It doesn't include some of the goals we have already in other ordinances that have our participation goals. This is just the goods and services and right. the city. So all those other, this doesn't, this isn't. Yeah, like if you're doing a development project in a city, we don't have this. No, that's right. Okay. So it would just be goods and services and engineering and construction um, category with um, what purchases we made with within the city for three years. Okay. City department. You can ask your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Major. Mr. Arnold? I don't have any questions, any more questions I should say, but thanks for the efforts you guys are putting into this. I think hopefully we can continue to see how this can grow and impact you know people doing business in the city house in a really positive way. Thank you. Mr. Appreciate that. Mr. Johnson. I guess one more question, Asia. All right, I'm, it's going to be quick. I, I guess it's more of a statement. I know last time we were talking about a professional, a professional services contract, but you said there's a new um, procedure in regards to that. Um, I guess of how we're value, have we kind of formalized what that looks like? I think we're interested. I mean, you mentioned it, I didn't mention it. Uh, you're, you're saying, <laughs> are you talking about the purchasing policy? Like yeah, how to go about, yeah, about engaging professional, professional services? services. Then, different departments and I remember we was talking about something you came in here when you said that. Yeah, I don't know if I said, but it came up with the architectural yeah. contract. You were not here. No, he, did, he was here to say that. Okay, but the question was, uh, how much I'm just about, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's not that fun saying, but the question came to, how did we end up settling on that architect and what are we doing to make sure that, although it's not a requirement for professional services, uh, but that we are making sure that we're looking at uh, the availability. Oh, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 for, 
uh, we want to be able to establish a protocol for that as well. Um, we're, we have to sit down and, and with each department when they have professional services. Uh, now I understand. Okay. So with regard to the new uh, procurement policy, with regard to professional services, every time that a department uh, procures services for professional services, they, that comes to me. Mm -hmm. And I sit down with the uh, individual department director and ensure that there has been an outreach, an attempted outreach, and what we can do to make sure that we're at least looking at lists that are more inclusive to see if that anybody else could, um, that are disadvantaged businesses, minority businesses, women-owned businesses, that could fulfill, possibly fulfill those roles. Okay. So that's, that's the new policy, that all, all the professional services contracts and as well as sole source contracts have to be approved by me before they can move forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Woolery, and thank you, Hillary, and thank you, Charlie, and thank you, Shishan. Uh, this is a wealth of information, and I just appreciate all the efforts you made to make sure that we receive this and, and hope that we get accurate data from this information. Thank you. You're Moving on to courtesy of the floor. Anyone to my right would like to come to the mic, please do so now. Al Davis, this, we can talk about it, anything, correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. Your address, please, Mr. Davis. Say again, please. Your address, please. 13th and Howard. Okay. Act 47, that's when you're in financial turmoil, correct? Exactly. And how we got here was from, or what, what the end result was we had to give up our water department, our incinerator, and our parking authority, all which can bring us in money. So whoever did that, I know it wasn't the current mayor, but that was uh, something really bad to do. They had bad legal advice on that one. But with the thing of fines, and I do have the paper, I asked twice so far, it was told to me that it's not for the average citizen to get any fines for putting the recyclables in the wrong container. And it's here and it says you will be fined if you don't rinse it out, if you don't put it in the right container, or if it's in the wrong container. I think that's going kind of hard on we the people because we did not elect officials or whoever to put you in charge to penalize us. I understand if we're in financial trouble, just like the, some cities, some states, they really go after people that are speeding or violations of your car. I understand that and it brings in money. But now we're going to trash to bring in and it can bring in a lot of money, I agree. And if, if it's for the city, I can see the city making a lot of money and even putting people in jail for not doing their recyclables correctly. I could see that. It, and, and from a city standpoint, I understand it. That's good business. But as a citizen of the city, that's not good. It punishes all of us, because all of us, and it's at the discretion, I guess, of the fine people that collect our trash. So with that, and then the, the landlord, because I was talking to Aaron, Mr. Aaron earlier, and he was letting me know that it's really for, like when the landlords you know, move their people out on the curb, mm -hmm. I understand that part. There's already a law for that. That's littering, that's obstruction, that's all that. That's already a law. He also said we have, at, at the last meeting, he said we have a lot of laws on the books we're just not enforcing them. So I could see this bill, that, and this is the bill right here, the code. I could see punishing whoever does illegal dumping 
1,000, 2,000, 5,000. I don't care what that is because that's illegal. But the recycling part where I asked multiple times and even people before me asked, and they said it was not for the regular citizen. It says right here, if you don't do it, this is your fine. So I don't think we should be fining people when we're in, uh, yes, it's in here. It, I, would you like me to f find it? It's right. Uh, well, and if you do happen to put the wrong material in, the city can refuse to take it. So that means accumulation of trash. So we're going kind of hard on this uh, recycle thing. And I understand, you know, it, 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 we, want, we want to do what's good. But at the same time, the fines are, are not the way to do it. Another question. Third Street, the, the curbs that they did down there, how much did that cost us? Because I actually was told about it and went down and looked. Did any of you go down and look at that? Every day. Every day. <laughs> I like you, Cornelius. <laughs> now, <laughs> now, I barely can get my truck up through there, and I'm wondering whose legal advice did that? I, that, that lawyer, that's, that's a problem because you can't get a fire truck up there comfortably. Did any of you guys see that? Anybody? That, that, that's a bad deal if your house is on fire. Oh, I'm sorry, we saw it today. It wasn't big Excuse, excuse like, me. Oh, you can't talk. Oh, ma'am, excuse <laughs> me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I won't ask questions no more. No. <laughs> I won't get nobody in trouble. I'm not gonna get anybody in trouble, but you can, that's okay, you, you didn't know. We can't blurt out, and you're, he's asking the question, I guess, yeah, I'm to sorry, the I won't administration. Do that. But uh, are, you, are you finished? Um, one, one more okay. thing. And it was also said that we must increase fines dramatically on this code, which is also recycling. So the code about dumping is fine. Mr. Aaron said there's already laws on it. To bring new laws that punish we the people, I think would be very wrong. I hope city council does not push this one through. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Anyone else to my right, please? I would like to speak, I'm sorry. Come on, Ken. I won't ask any questions. You can ask all the questions you want. I'm August Davis. I live at 700 block of South 25th Street. Oh, I'm out of breath. <clears throat> so I just had a few questions. Who am I directing them to? Council? Yeah. The ministry, it depends on what the question is. All right, well, it's something like the recyclable. I'm noticing lately that when the wind blows, some people's recyclable are extremely high, which I'm not saying they can help it. You don't know if you have a cookout or party over the weekend. And then the recyclable can, by the time they come to um, put them in the truck, they spilt over. If I'm correct, we're not supposed to put recyclable in a bag to put outside into the recyclable, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay, so then when it spills over, can we not get the tubs that have the lids on them, the recyclable, the big ones like the green ones we have? I know it's downtown when I saw that sidewalk today. They had the yellow ones on top, which I guess that means recyclable. Thinks what our township also has them. Do we not have that in the budget? Because those lids, it, when that big wind comes, which was several weeks ago, that trash was literally out front. Mine even fell over, but I went out and lifted mine up and a few neighbors. But I'm just saying, some people were probably in bed. It was like um, anywhere between 11 and 1 at night. I wasn't paying attention to the time. So people are asleep. They're not coming out, and it blows down the street. It's under people's cars. So that's also littering the city. OK, the thing after that was, um, oh, is, is, and I had a paper. I only had a few minutes to read. I just heard about the meeting tonight. But isn't there a certain time, if I read a paper correctly, that you're supposed to put your trash out? I think it's after, on your trash day. You can put it out 7 p.m., but it has to be out by 6 a.m., and then it has to get off the city streets and sidewalk by a certain time. I don't know what time that was. What time is that? It's 24 hours. Mr. No. no, it's not. No, it's not. Mr. Johnson, could you, ask, could you address that for us? No. Uh, Mr. West, could you come? 9 p.m. 9 p.m. Oh, 9 p.m. to get about. That so night. somebody. At night, other uh, trash. But someone's on vacation. See, that's kind of hard. Then they don't put it out, but the trash is over—not overspilling, but it's high. I've never seen it. I'm assuming, 
And then they have to, if they put it out before they leave, then they need somebody to put it back within 24 hours. Is that, is that also a fine? Not a fine. Can I, can I yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, how you ask permission? Just answer me. Excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. John. Wait a minute. Wait. Wait. Let's let's take control of this, Mr. Johnson. Would you come to the mic, please? We don't want you spurring out answers. Thank you, dear. Let her. Let him come. Okay. You suppose put your trash out the night before nine o'clock. Okay. okay. It's um, early at seven. Yes. Till six a.m. Okay. So we start at residential, we start at 5 o'clock. 5, okay. Uh, commercial starts 3 o'clock in the morning. Three. Okay. So say you said somebody go on vacation, mm -hmm. you put it out before they leave, right? Now, the right thing to do is to call us, call the sanitation okay. department, and say, I'm going on vacation, I'm having a trash out, could you please put my trash can back? Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. No, because we don't advertise or anything, because we advertise. <laughs> 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 just did. No, you just did. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that won't say anything. Right. So okay. Now, so we, we on channel 20, so they hear me. But, <laughs> let, let, let's kind of get in order here. <laughs> I'm on TV? But, but yeah, you're on TV. So. <laughs> you're on live stream, as a matter of fact. <laughs> so, but anyway. Little camera shy, go ahead. But, but, but anyway, I mean, it's just communicating. We're here to help. You know, All right. uh, uh, we're not here to hurt you. We are community oriented, you know, and anybody that called us, we definitely will come out here and provide the service for you because we go over and beyond. Now, some of the things that we shouldn't be doing, like I said, we don't advertise it, but we help you out one or two times, but the third time, you know, you got to, you know, come on board. But that was nice, though. Okay. You know. All right. But uh, again, then also, our guys that do a real good job on their route, and I stress this, we have meetings every Wednesday, that you should know your route. So if Miss Jane didn't put her trash out, oh, so I know if Miss Jane didn't okay. put her trash out. I'm gonna go get Miss Jane, Miss Jane's trash, you know, because mm. it's up against the house. I'm gonna get it, and then when I see Miss Jane, hey, Miss Jane, you, know, you forgot to put your trash out. That's that's it. Okay. But if you're gonna go on vacation, it'd be nice for us to know so we can know that we make a note of it, and then we'll go ahead and take that extra step. Excellent. What about the recyclables with the lids on? Okay. Why do we have these I'm little glad, bitty I'm ones glad, with no lids? I'm glad you it's asked hard. that. No, no, we had one smaller than that. I know, I had one okay. too. Remember we had really the little hard. blue one? Oh. Okay, so we went to a larger one. This is 32. You did. You know, you 32 did. ounces, right? So now the problem with the lids is just what you just said, the wind. So the wind blows, and that's, that's Mother Nature, so we can't control that. It's going to blow them all over the You can make it bottom heavy, though, bottom heavy of the trash can. It won't go as well, quick. Well, well, again, that 32 ounce, you say somebody's like 62 years old. Uh, that's kind of heavy for them. That's to retirement. <laughs> yeah. You know, so we kind of like okay. them up on a machine now. I noticed okay. that. Okay, no. excuse me. Wait, let me, let me kind of take control of this. <laughs> oh, is this a city council? Because this is a meeting. Okay, and I sorry. need to get done. Yeah, yeah, we need to get done and real quick. Let me have you talk to Mr. Johnson with your questions yeah, after the meeting, ma'am. wait. Yes. Thank oh, you. Because yeah. it seems like she has a bunch more. Well, no, no, no. Actually, that's it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let me have Mr. Johnson speak with you, you after the meeting. Yeah. Thank that's you so much. Problem. Okay. Anyone else to my right? Okay. Uh, yes. My name is Russell. Um, I'm sorry, Russell. Russell Blues. And your address, please, Mr. Blues. Um, 13th and Vernon. Um, <clears throat> One of my concerns is the Act 47, obviously, uh, and what's going to happen with that because that's uh, they're asking to step out of that but still have excessive taxing capabilities um, without having state monitoring. To me, that to be uh, to not to be overseen by a higher authority is only going to create a problem. Um, same thing with the trash, uh, the, the fines for the, for the trash. Are we also going to have <coughs> codes enforcement that are also going to be running around writing up all that stuff now? Is codes enforcement going to be involved in that? Yes. Yes. Not the sanitation side of things, but like if you're trashing in the yard, that's there. We don't have to go Okay. Anymore. Well, so where does this end up in court at? is because we have the parking process, okay, which is another thing. The, you have to let a ticket, there is no mediation for a ticket. 
there's absolutely nothing. You have to let it become a criminal charge and go to a district justice and of you course. walk in and there's 35 of those, whatever, green, and it is $150, a $30 ticket. If you, I mean, sure, maybe you should just pay the 30 bucks if you did something wrong, which is what I normally do. But if I'm not doing it, I'm, I'm definitely taking it to court. So we have excessive citation right now going through, especially on the landlords and investors. Um, the another thing on this Act 47, I mean, I don't know what's the silly, the, what, what's the affiliation between the Harrisburg Housing Authority and the city of Harrisburg? What do you mean? What's the affiliation? Well, there. I know the mayor's signature has to be on everything that goes through there, and it's a nonprofit agency that brings in in rental income somewhere around 2.8 million plus a month. Uh, figures around 30 to 35 million dollars a year uh, that pays absolutely no property taxes. It's tax exempt property, isn't that a nonprofit? It's a taxes and property, just as That's well, insane, right. just but, as well as the state buildings. The, the twenty state buildings we have here are taxes yeah, as well. Tax building. When you're talking about state buildings, not that I agree with it because the state should have to put money towards the federal mm -hmm. government. Also should. So should Dolphin County. They, if they're using the amenities, they should be contributing whatever, however that works out. But when you have the largest landlord in the city of Harrisburg paying absolutely no taxes, bringing in an average rent of $980 a month for close to 3,000 units, and then throw in the redevelopment authority on top of that, add another 900, 1,000 properties that are untaxed. To me, this looks like a theft by deception is what it looks like. So we go and we pass all kinds of legislation where we're going to bomb out the landlords and and go after the landlords and now I take we're it you're picking a on the trash. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Now we're going from one extreme to another. I mean, okay. what's pretty soon you guys are going to be uh, checking to see if we have underwear on or not. Okay. Well, thank you. Well, thank you, sir. We appreciate that. Anyone else to my right? Yes, good evening. Uh, my name is Otis Harrison, 1500 Market Street. And the question is, um, what about people parking on the curb when the street is narrow and people are getting tickets for that? Um, I noticed now that y'all have people coming out, giving tickets to people that's parking on the curbs. But just like uh, a couple of weeks ago, the fire truck could even come down the street because it was so tight so what are we what's going to happen with that situation as far as that well you're just making us aware of that okay and so um, you must be one of the individuals who received the ticket no i haven't on received one but oh, okay. still and yet i notice people have have been receiving parking tickets on the curb when because the there's a law right. against Curb, our okay. cars being up on the curb, parked on the curb. Okay, so now this person's car got hit by the fire truck. So, did the fire truck reimburse him for doing the damage? Absolutely. We should done? be able to talk to someone up in personnel office regarding oh, okay. that. Okay. And insurance. Oh, okay. All right. So, where well, the person didn't know, so. Okay. Uh, we'll let him know. I'm sure if you would talk to the director, Joni, and she would direct you to the right person who handles. Uh, we're self-insured, so the city is self-insured. I'm sure they'll be able to work with you regarding that. As a matter of fact, the chief is here, isn't he? Chief, excuse me. <laughs> chief, were you aware that uh, one of the vehicles in the city of Harrisburg was hit by one of the fire trucks? Are you aware of any incidents where that happened? Not recently. Okay. Um, we've had a couple of incidents, but um, typically what Thank you, Chief.
I'm not aware of any that weren't reported. Um, and typically the way that works, um, if, if we know that we hit a car, we'll stop. Uh, HPD is involved and then uh, we exchange information. They obviously get that and it goes to HR up to Joni yes. and then we process that through an insurance claim uh, and then the city pays for the repairs for anything. It's just like they do with the garbage trucks and everything else. Okay. So, sir, does that answer your question? Oh, yes, it does. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Yep, Thank you. Anyone else to my right, please? Anyone in the middle? Aaron Johnson, 1508 South 13th Street. Uh, I just want to speak on uh, well, the three meetings that we had, which we, which we had uh, wonderful meetings. I'm glad the public came out, spoke on uh, you know the things that were on their mind. And also, I just want to share with everybody that's here and uh, people that's watching television. We had 1820 packs in the street. That's where the public works um, uh, office is at. And we open book. You can come see us anytime. If you got any issues, to come talk to us. Plenty of parking. Okay, so you don't have to worry about getting a ticket. Um, but the one thing that I do want to share with you is, you know, we're talking about uh, accountability. You know, I got 20 plus years. My deputy director, Dave West, got 20 plus years. And why do you think the city's dirty? Okay, let me, let me, let's talk about that a little bit. Why do you think the city's dirty? Because we have to hold people accountable. We're not talking about the good people who basically put their trash out properly. It's the ones you live next door to when you call us and say, hey, man, this cat just moved out his whole house is on the curb. And I, and I stated this in our community meetings. Well, why do you think that we shouldn't hold them accountable? We have to get some kind of control on this. We talk about blight all the time. If we don't do anything, it's going to get worse before it gets better. So the fines, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you ain't going to get a fine. It's for the ones who don't get it, that think they can come in this city and do what they want to do. You got some good landlords and you got some bad ones, okay? And that's truth, that's real. We deal with it every single day, okay? So again, you call us to handle something, so now we want to put it on the books so we can hold people accountable, but don't get mad at us because this is what we want to do. This is not for us to get rich. We should have been done this, okay? Like I told uh, Russell here, right? Sure, we got stuff on the books. We never enforced it. When we had the water department, when the water department's here with the city, we used to put liens against people's houses so that they could pay their water bill in a trash bill. You know, you've got $2 million laying on the table. We can do something with $2 million, but people don't pay the bill. So again, when we all we're doing is advocating to a lot of folks and saying, hey, it's okay, you ain't gotta pay your bill. Now, we always hear this too, okay? We're talking about parking. You know, parking is a problem throughout the city because when I was young, you know, you had one car to a household. Yeah, had plenty parking there. Well, now you got everybody staying home now. You got four and five cars to one house. So parking is a big issue. Zarka Street, Penn Street, you know, South uh, 14th Street. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a lot of streets that have major issues where you can't get the fire truck. Trash trucks, our trash trucks are large now. We have problems with parking. Now, people, they call me, you know, hey, uh, come see me. And, and, you know, I take care of the parking ticket or whatever because of, it is an issue because you're parking on both sides. We have to take and reevaluate a whole lot of things because, again, this city, you know, we outgrown the city a little bit here. So it is an issue. So not, not only if you just address, it, we get calls like that all the time, you know. So, again, with this trash, it's not no personal attack on anyone in the city. It's the ones who keep doing the same thing over and over again, okay? For, I'll give you an example, then I'm gonna shut it down, okay? Like when people buy these houses, okay, for $500, okay, so then they gut it out. Now, you gutting the house out, but you're not doing the proper thing. You're not getting a container, you know, a 30-yard container to put on the curb, call downtown here to get a street permit, and put all your stuff in the container and let waste management and all of them haul it because we get ready to get into that business. We get ready to buy us some container and get a container truck so we can do, do it ourselves. But right now, that's the proper thing to do. They don't do that. They put everything out on the curb. Uh, wood ain't trash. You know what I mean? That's building material. So these are the type of things that we deal with on a constant basis 
And then, you know, people don't want to get involved because, you know, retaliation. And I understand that. But for us to clean this city up, definitely the citizens have to help us help them. But we always been here to help anybody. Right now, you might not know. We paved in the alleys where we actually pick up the trash at. We destroyed the alleys because our trash trucks are too heavy for the alleys. But we're paving them right now. Okay? Some people say, oh man, the potholes all over the place in the streets. Okay? Yeah, I got that. But we don't have that kind of equipment to pave uh, 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 Third Street and Bear Hill, all that. We have to contract that out. But right now, we are actually paving the alleys where we actually put the trash at. Now, we're not going to complete uptown and on the hill, but we're doing, we doing it now. Doing demo. It's a lot of good things that we do do. But again, like I said, communication. All you got to do is call us. That's all you have to do. I've said enough. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. And I certainly do agree with you, Mr. Johnson, and, and, and I was going to state that fact uh, after you had sat down. Uh, it is a problem with the city of Harrisburg. When you ride through the city of Harrisburg, you see people open their car door and throw out a whole container of um, McDonald boxes from their children, you know, eating. Or if you, you're walking down the street, they just drink a soda and they just throw it in the street. So we do have a problem. If you want to have big Harrisburg up, then we have to hold landlords accountable because there are a lot of landlords that do empty out houses and throw them all over the sidewalk. And there's a lot of sidewalks where people are parking and now the sidewalks are cracking and they won't repair them and then we have people falling on the sidewalks and they're holding homeowners accountable. So that's why we don't allow people to park on the sidewalks. But if you're worried about us getting rich from them little bit of fines, we're certainly not going to get rich because we're not going to catch all the corporates that do all the dirt. So, no, no, sir, no more comments. It's my time, okay? But I thank you for your comments, and then afterwards, you still have some issues that I invite you to meet with the Department of Public Works to discuss those. Okay. I'm sorry, I stopped at anyone to my left. Oh, I'm sorry, in the middle. Sorry. Dan Miller, I'm the Harrisburg City Treasurer, and I'm at 123 Emerald Street. And Aaron, I want to thank you for what you just said, because I want to hop right on to that. And this is about accountability. And I'm speaking to everybody in Harrisburg that pays their trash bill. Great for you. That's important. But in 2016 and 2017, there was $4 million of trash fees we were not able to collect. And tonight, City Council has a chance to change all that and to hold those people accountable. What we'd like to do and what we're proposing is that we go to an annual billing, which means it goes on the city real estate tax notice. And if we do that, we have a chance to collect that money. Before, when we had sewer, water, and trash, the city had leverage over its residents. If people didn't pay their trash bill, their water bill, we could go out there and turn the water off. We don't like doing that, but they came down and they paid those bills. Since we no longer have the water, we don't have any leverage. And so folks aren't paying their trash bills. And so everybody who is paying their trash bill, that's great. But there's a lot of people out there who aren't. And so I would encourage city council to let's hold everybody accountable. Let's keep that in the bill. And let's go to annual billing. And let's collect $2 million a year. That's a lot of money that, that we just lost in two years. We're owed $9 million in trash fees at the end of 2017. So I'd like to see us keep progressing and let's hold people accountable and let's make the city a better place because we can use that money. Anyone else in the middle, please? Anyone to my left? Oh, I'm sorry. You, but you can come. I'm left. You can wait. Okay. I just walked around. Okay. That's fine. Good evening. Good evening, my name is Evelyn Hunt and I live in the 1800 block of State Street. I think with the trash bill, one of the key concerns is people are seeing fines, but what people are gonna be fined for is not defined well enough. Because from going to the last public meeting, I, got, I had the understanding that uh, the people who collect the trash in the city are not going to be going through the trash to see if we put a bottle in there. That's, they don't have time for that. Plus, the city, uh, I thought was agreeable to people who can take 
glass to the various fire companies can, but those who can't can continue to throw it into the trash. That's what my understanding was from the last meeting. This uh, trash bill and the collecting the fees annually, I don't think that's a big issue. I think the issue that people are having problems with are the people who can't afford to pay that all at one time. And they want to continue to pay it monthly. However, they don't want to give the city permission to go into their checking account. Basically, the way that bill is currently written, unless they changed it, what it said was, if you want a waiver from um, having them go into your checking account and pulling the um, fees, you have to show some kind of hardship, like you have checks that bounce, or you filed bankruptcy. Basically, that's none of your business. I don't think a person should have to tell you that. If a person says, I'm going to pay monthly, give them the coupons and let them pay monthly. The third thing, um, I believe, uh, was Act 47. When Act 47 came, people, uh, one, of, one tax was doubled, another tax was tripled. It was with the understanding that these were temporary measures and they could be extended. And I believe we still need the extension. However, you can't go out to the public and to people and tell people it's temporary and temporary but there's no end to it. At some point, the city is going to have to figure out how to wean itself off of those taxes or go back to the public and say, yes, we said temporary, but we didn't mean temporary. We have to have this permanently, but don't say extensions temporary when it's not. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, sir. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick O'Connell, uh, 1924 Nauta Street. Um, first, I'd like to thank Mr. Johnson and Mr. West, uh, because uh, also you know, Pap and Fusta uh, had a meeting um, a few months ago. Um, and after said meeting, uh, it really inspired uh, my wife and myself, basically, to do a little bit more in our uh, community and get things straightened up. And Mr. Uh, Johnson, Mr. West, they have been very instrumental, um, working with us very closely to get things moving, and I'm very appreciative of that, and the fact that they're here with their superiors, <coughs> and, you know, they're doing a great job. Um, this evening, we're here because uh, we were actually informed by them that there was going to be a meeting, and we have an issue over and Monada, between Monada and Lennox, which is a feline issue. Um, unfortunately, in Less than the two hours, my wife had actually been on the phone with several individuals, and everyone just kept passing the buck. Um, and she was also informed that, that there had been several meetings about felines in the city, and unfortunately, it goes nowhere. It is to the point where, on a sunny day like this, um, the stench from the feces is unbearable the flies, the mosquitoes, and um, we learned as well that uh, a couple of years ago there was a intervention where they removed several, uh, about 40 or plus uh, felines from the area. And unfortunately you have some individuals that feed them, that they're, they're not taking ownership of them, but they're feeding them. Our question is, how do we go about resolving this issue, holding people accountable uh, if you want the pets, there's not a problem. You could have your pets at home and so forth, take care of them. But once they're wandering and they're going to other individuals' yard that don't have any pets and they're leaving their feces or they're vomiting and all the other stuff that goes along with it, it's really not pleasant at all. So we came down this evening with our little one to be able to ask how can we go about resolving this issue for our neighborhood? Because everyone in our neighborhood for the most part, <laughs> but the majority of them are not pleased with this at all. Have you contacted Animal Control? We contacted Animal Control. They were out there today and... I was oh, just going to add, sorry, I spoke with Animal Control this morning. They said the issue is that there's a no-kill law um, 
what they can do is take the cat from the neighborhood, spay or neuter it, but then they bring it right back, back to the yeah, neighborhood. They do. They do. Yeah, and we have about 30 plus cats in our neighborhood right now. Oh my gosh. They have it's no very, orders. very bad. And um, I'm not sure if you're aware or not, but cats in their feces carry bacteria. It's very bad for you. It's, it's bad for children, elderly people, and pregnant women. So, and, uh, given the fact that we have a newborn, we're extremely concerned by that as well because they do come through our property and sometimes you're walking, you're leaving, you're going out, and you have to actually play hopscotch not to walk in any feces okay. and so forth. So, Just a minute. Mr. Grover, we're allowed uh, so many cats. Mr. Grover, we're allowed to take so many cats to the Pennsylvania Human. We have an annual contract with Right, the so how many do can we take? I would have to look that up. Can, I we, can we not connect with uh, them with Mr. The animal control. So yeah, we have two animal control officers now, and we we have and we have a contract with um, the ASPCA. Okay. That we take animals out there. Well, we can we can remove some of those cats. We have a, a certain limit, total number of cats that we can take to the ASPCA. Appreciate that. Yes. So, and it's not a. I used to deal with um like cats when I was an enforcement officer. So it's not necessarily a limit. It's actually a charge. So. Um, Charge. Yeah, so there's the currently municipalities are charged $135 per cat when they're taken to the um, Humane Society. And usually when they end up at the Humane Society, um, they, don't, they don't come back because that's where they do the, um, they euthanize the cats there at the, at the site. Mm -hmm. So one of, one, of the, one of the methods they talk about is what you mentioned, this TNR trap neuter release, where um, they stop the overall um, because what's happening is they're not neutered, mm -hmm. they're going to keep on reproducing and right. then the process mm -hmm. doesn't run right. away. Um, so some, depending on the neighborhood, some, um, some neighbors are, are active in that trap neuter release where they're getting those cat neuters mm -hmm. and that's why sometimes you'll kind of see, you know, them placing out food. But um, in communities when, we used to, when it used to be done in such a township, there used to be certain provisions about you know, you, sh you shouldn't have food out all day because then you're right. attracting all types of animals. Exactly. So they're not doing it inside a responsible way. And if they're not doing it in a way where the, the cats are being neutered, it becomes a bigger, bigger problem, which I think you guys are talking more to. Yeah. But I think we're, we're past that, that yeah. point right now. So, 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 eventually, so I, I don't know. I can talk to um, Fred and I forgot what the other guy. I think Thank the other you. guy's name is Bill. Fred mm -hmm. is who I spoke to this yeah. morning. Okay. About because he's, he's familiar. He's familiar with that entire process. But. I don't know if there's some release in regard release in regards to the amount of cats that may be out there where we can kind of work towards any cats that are maybe not neuter or maybe just need to go from there. But I think what happens is they don't really become they're not really people's cats. They become the neighborhood cats because right. even the people yeah. who are feeding them, exactly, are there, it's not their cats. You see what right. I'm saying? Right. But they're doing it in the more of a kind of saying like, hey, at least it's a bigger thing when they take them to get a neuter because that means they're helping to make sure they're not spreading. So I think yeah. it's just about understanding from a community aspect what's actually happening. Are they neutered? Do they need to disappear? Um, but I think it's a dynamic that happens in multiple neighbors, not just in Harrisburg, but throughout all surrounding communities. Yeah. Uh, Fr Fred met with them this morning, but I think, I don't know if Fred's already had his quota for us. That's what I was trying to, to I was trying to explain to Mr. Johnson that we are only allowed so many cats right. taken from the city of Harrisburg before we charged. Right. So, but the, 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 the bigger picture is it's like, anything else, it's like it becomes an epidemic because this is a big issue, it's a major issue. This is the second go around, if you remember, uh, Mary Papoos, we did that about three years ago. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we, the same, we talked about Man of the Street, the same area. Where's we, that? Yeah. Man of the Street. Man of the Street. That's where you got to take him out of the house. Yeah, right, right, right. 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 We did that about three years ago already. Right. We had the same situation, so it's right back again. So. Uh, I, I guess it's just like uh, with the televisions when you know DEP did right. what they did, uh, uh, mandated certain things. It's the same uh, situation with these cats. What do we do if they say that they're not going to take them? So I mean, I don't think you'll be being overrun by by these cats. I don't think. I think it's the amount. That it's, they're not like they're storing the cats. So it's not the fact that they're not going to take them. I think there's an agreement where we're not trying to pay over a certain amount. Right. Because For it's not like the percentage. cats are living there. They are. They're they're going to the afterlife. So I think it's. Finding within our, our contract that because we have to approve it basically of saying that if we're taking cats there that we're willing to, to pay the charge. A lot of municipalities have kind of honed in on the charge because it is expensive. It's one hundred thirty five dollars per cat and they're just getting knocked off. You see what I'm saying? So I think it's just something that if we have to analyze the situation and realize that that's a cost that we want to acquire if if we're over our kind of limit of what what they would usually take 
for no cost. You see what I'm right. saying? Mm -hmm. Under the contract. So mm -hmm. what would be the immediate action step after this meeting that uh, we could take to? Well, let us have an opportunity to talk to uh, Mr. Lamke to find out what we can do as well as with Mr. Grover to see how many cats we have taken out so far this year. Okay. And um, if you would leave your information with Mr. Petrosky, we certainly would appreciate it. Sure. Definitely. Okay. Definitely. Thank you Thank very you much. So much. We appreciate your time. Yes. You're welcome. I'll come around. Is anyone else on the left that would like to come to the mic? Okay. Thank you. Moving on with the agenda. Approve of minutes, approve the legislative session minutes of June 26, 2013. Are there any omissions, deletions, or corrections? Hearing none, minutes will stand as approved. Reports of committees, we have none this evening. Re ordinance for first reading, we have none this evening. Moving on to override vote of mayoral veto. Mr. Petrosky. Yeah, um, Bill 6 as amended of 2018 was moved by Mr. Madsen, seconded by Ms. Daniels. It's an ordinance appropriating community development block grant funds from the United States Department of Housing Development for fiscal year 2018 and authorizing expenditure of such funds. Mr. Yeah. Madsen? Madam President, I would like to first make a motion to reconsider Bill 6 as amended and approved on June 26th. I have a second. 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 Any discussion on the motion? Okay, call the vote. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Um, Madam President, I would like to make a motion to amend striking out the amendment made to Bill 6 prior to its passage on June 26th. A second? Second. Any discussion? Call the vote, please. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Okay, Madam President, finally, I'd like to make a motion to approve Bill 6 in its original form. Evan, mo second? second? Second. Okay, discussion on the motion? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Bill 6 passes. Thank you. And at this point, I want to make a statement regarding Bill 6. Mr. Madsen, who is the chair for uh, CDBG, was not here, so I took over his uh, commitment with the legislation with Bill 6. I'm just going to take a few minutes to take the time to explain the process involved with Bill Number 6, which is the Community Development Block Grant Funding. And the reason I'm doing this is because I had several questions that were asked of me regarding this particular bill. The mayor appoints a review board, and they, their position is to evaluate and rate the subrecipients, the applications. The final ratings from the board comes to council, who then reviews the recommendations and forwards back to the mayor with amendments or approval of the board's decision. At that point, the mayor will make a decision to agree with council amendments or vetoes the bill. On Friday, June 29, 2018, the mayor vetoed the bill with amendments submitted by council. Now, at this stage, it goes back to the original legislation for a vote before city council. Council has the duty to vote on the veto or let the original recommendations on Bill 6 stand. Now to the nonprofit and subrecipients, if your organization applies for monetary assistance and are not, appoint, are not approved, it is incumbent upon you to find out why your application was not selected. If you were not approved, the reason may have been because your application was not complete or did not comply with what was required. Please take the rest of this year to get your organization technical assistance to find out what you must do to strengthen your application so that next year you will be in a better position to compete for the CDBG funding. 
I'm asking all of the nonprofit organizations who are interested in applying for next year community-based funds to take the time to find out what the requirements are and reach out for guidance from our city employees so that you are not disappointed because your organization is left out because of a technicality. I thank all of the community-based organizations who are out here working tirelessly to create a healthier Harrisburg. And please, as I indicated, so that there's not additional questions, I think, uh, Ms. Parker, correct me if I'm not right, uh, there is assistance provided before the application period. Absolutely. Okay, and I think that starts in February. So just a bit of information for those organizations who's looking for next year funding from CDBG grants. Thank you. Moving on to ordinance for amendments, Bill 3 of 2018. Oh. Mr. Petrosky, please read it into record. Bill 3 of 2018 uh, was moved by Mr. Major, seconded by Ms. Green. It's an ordinance amending and reorganizing Part 3 of Title IX of the codified ordinances of the City of Harrisburg entitled the Municipal Waste and Recycling Code to reflect enhancements to the city's collection and ma management of solid waste, recyclable, and composting materials. To improve efficiencies in the collection of residential municipal waste fees by instituting annual billing to provide a discount period to identify prohibited acts which constitute violations of this code and to strengthen enforcement of the this code by authorizing the use of enforcement officers and establishing fines and penalties for violations of this code. Mr. Majors, I think you have an amendment. Well, Madam President, first I'd like to ask for a, a brief recess for some clarification on one of the amendments. I have a motion to recess. We have a second? Second. Thank you. We will recess for 15 minutes. No, I don't, I don't need 15 minutes. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. Legislative session is now back in session. Moving on to bill number three. Mr. Majors has an amendment. President Wentz, I have a couple amendments. I'll do the, uh, I'll do the first one, uh, well, I'll do one first. It'll, it is going to amend uh, bill three on, I guess, well, this is the copy that I have. This is, uh, it's, uh, let me get the section number correct. Okay. It is, Label D, billing and accounts. Um, we're going to strike the line number. Uh, the line number on my paper here is 822. It's 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 number five. Uh, it says the owner of a vacant property excuse me, shall be respons shall not be responsible for payment of the annual disposal and collection fees of municipal. Hold on. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll I'll do I'll do it this way. So, looking to add a section, it's E. It'll be vacant property exemption, and it shall read as follows. It'll be uh, on 822. It's the owner of a vacant property shall be exempt from the payment of disposal and collection fees for municipal waste services. In order for the vacant property exemption. The owner or owner's agent must annually complete an exemption application certifying that the property is vacant. The director of public works, DPW, or the director's designee shall be responsible for determining whether an applicant's property is vacant for the purposes of this chapter. Mr. Major, could I ask for a point of clarification? Uh, on, eight, on, on what I have as the, the bill is introduced, this part five comes yes. in as line 821 through 824. Is your motion to strike that and replace it with the language you just? Correct, yeah, that'll strike line 821 through 824 and replace it Our with striking. the, yes. Okay. yes. Thank you. So vacant property exception owners shall be exempt from disposable and waste fees. That's your intention? Yes, so the goal of the amendment is to Require so we had discussed during the, the process in Bill Three would allow for a vacant property or a vacant lot to be exempt from paying a trash bill. Uh, initially, the language was to require the Department of Public Works to ver to certify that the property was vacant. The goal of this is to require a property or a landowner to certify with the department that the property is vacant, 
and then the department will then do a verification to ensure that it meets the definition of a vacant property for the purposes of Bill 3. Uh, Mr. Majors, would you, it, it may be easier to take these as motions one at a time? Yes, this is, that's, 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 that's the amendment. That's the amendment. have a second? Second. Now additional questions and comments on the motion? Is this a way of holding the property owner and knowing who the property, the vacant property belongs to? Yes. Okay. The goal is so if you, we're, we're looking to provide, if you have a vacant property, we don't, we want to take, we don't want to charge you if you're not collect, accumulating any trash. There's been an issue in the past where we charge every parcel of land in the city of Harrisburg the $32.34 regardless of if they are accumulating trash or not. This is a process to allow a property owner should they want, should they certify themselves as that property being truly vacant, not to be subject to a, a trash bill. Okay, and that's good clarification for the public, thank you. But my concern would be if you exempt them, then if you have dumping on that particular vacant property, who gets to be responsible but the Department of Public Works who well, ends up, who ends up disposing of that. Okay, so this is, this does not exempt you from the other parts of the ordinance. This is saying that for the purposes of receiving a trash bill, okay. we are not going to be providing you a trash bill. We would have, we would then have, through this, we would have that person's or their designee, we would have information on who owns said okay. property. So okay. if there is a legal dumping or excessive accumulation or something that violates the sanitation ordinance on that said property, we would know who exactly to be able to uh, go after for that occurring on that property. Well, thank you. I just wanted you to clarify that for the, the public who is listening. Um, and then, I don't have any other questions. And then just to piggyback, that would be subject under this ordinance to um, category one fines, and also you're also subject to the cleanup fees, which is also right. provision of the penalties if the public works have to go in there and clean it up. So I kind of still cover that base, you know, okay. for that vacant yeah. property. Yeah. The goal isn't to absolve them of any responsibilities for the property. It's really to under to know exactly who owns the property. They don't receive a trash bill, but if there are other penalties that occur that are, not it's not a trash bill, you would still be, uh, you would still be responsible for those, those fines or penalties. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. And your second amendment, Mr. Okay. Majors? All right, the second amendment, uh, and would you like, Neil, would you like each of the, some of these are sort of omnibuses, they all touch the same issue, but they're in different sections. Should I do them one at a time or? It's probably you could do one at a time just because there's a record, it's clean, it, you know, so you make one motion, read it in, you know. Okay, all right. I really don't have a sense of how many you have if it's, if it's omnibus. I think Ron has a better sense of that than I do. No, I think. The, the next amendment pretty much touches, well, okay. About do, I'll explain why I'm looking to do the amendment and then uh, try to go through the pages and we'll see where we go from there. All right. The amendment, so current, we're proposing looking to require annual billing and it be attached to your real estate taxes. Um, from our meetings in we, we heard from the public that that's something that they uh, see could potentially be burdensome to them and had an issue with the potential of that uh, putting their property at risk. Um, we understand that it, city taxes fall below county taxes in the order of responsibility when they do collect the taxes, but um, the amendment is seeking to remove that provision. Currently, I understand the need to uh, look to have a issue to, to have a reason to compel uh, folks that are not paying their trash bills um, to compel them to do so. Uh, I think that we may be able to explore other options. I am doing this. I am not opposed to the concept. I think that we need to try to attempt to reconcile some of the uh, some of our current collection numbers uh, to ensure that we have to ensure that we can collect on what we are owed. So the amendment is, is going to remove the annual billing currently. Uh, 
would be more than willing to look at it um, in the future. But right now, this is what that amendment seeks to do. So in doing so, this would amend uh, line eight. It would remove, it would strike, uh, in the, starting in the middle of the line eight, it would strike to improve the efficiencies of collection of residential municipal waste fees by instituting annual billing, semicolon to provide a discount period, so that would be removed. Then moving on to line 794. Beginning on line 794D, it would strike billing, it would, excuse me, it would strike end payments and replace it with accounts. So the line D should read billing accounts. We would remove the uh, brackets beginning at line 795, uh, which in the line reads all billings for charge, for charges under this chapter shall be prepared in a manner prepared in the name of the owner um, all the way down to line 801, which is property involved. So we remove that, um, remove the brackets making what is in current law um, in the current ordinance stand. It would additionally, it would remove, um, yeah, it would remove lines 802, all of line 802 through line 819. It would also remove lines 830 and 831. Can I ask what you have, Councilman? Is Excuse me, sorry. Yeah, 830. I have it's uh, number six. It's commercial property owners will be billed for municipal waste services on a monthly basis. So it would strike that language and revert back to. Uh, so in the original bill, I have that as eight line as line 826. Okay. So 826, and you're trying to strike subpart six, right? Yes, subpart six, so that's correct. Bill, I have that as 826 okay. and 827. All right, I'm sorry, I'm reading off of one, ver one of the markups. I think. One of the yeah. markups, correct. So can we go backwards then for a moment? Yes. To make sure that what you, the lines you just read are actually the ones you intend to strike? Oh, this one. Uh, you st I believe you struck starting at 802, and where the words are billing and payment, or did you not strike that? You started the 804 annual fee. Yeah. Yeah. So I was, so I guess that would be part D, which is in the, or it's billing and payments. Billing and payments. And I would strike end payments and replace it with accounts. So it would read D, billing accounts. Mm -hmm. um, and so on, on this original, it's line, that's line 794. Line Same. 794. Okay. So, yeah. See if I can get it. And then you struck the bracket at 795 and 801. That's correct. That, that, that alignment is the same. And then the next portion you were the next portion you were asking or moving to strike is which line, sir? I am attempting to pull up a clean There's version. 802 to 819. You said. 802, so that's that's still consistent. That's still consistent. Yep, okay. yep. My apologies. Just no, it's okay. Okay. Additionally, would add language under section three delegation, which I have starts on line 1363. And I have delegation starting at line 1359. Okay. One sentence. Starts with appropriate, ends with ordinance. Okay. And that was, you said 1359? 1359. Okay. So I believe, and so line 1360 ends with this ordinance. Is that correct? It actually rolls over onto 1361. 
1361. Effectuate this ordinance. To effectuate this ordinance on 1361. So following effectuate this ordinance on line 1361, would like to add the following language, which would uh, note that it would say that it is the intent of council of the city of Harrisburg that this ordinance take effect on January 1st, 2019. And with that, I believe that it concludes my amendment. Um, I, the goal again is to uh, ensure that we are, we want to treat, my goal really is to treat the residents and commercial property owners the same. Uh, the way we have it currently drafted, uh, residential property owners would, have, would, would be subject to annual billing and their, and their property potentially be subject to uh, taken through the county. This would currently treat everyone, this would treat everyone the same. Um, so I'll let the vote say where it is, but I'd ask my council members to support said amendment. And if there's any questions, I'd feel free to. Second. Wait, just before the, I'm sorry. So right. the point. Question. No, after yeah. the second, he the made a motion second. 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 So now you may ask your question. So Wes, just to clarify too, so this amendment um, aligns the billing to be the same between commercial and residential and removes the annual billing. Right. 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 This would remove the annual billing. Uh, in addition, it would, we would go back and revert back to the way collections are currently done in the city of Harrisburg. So on a month by month basis, right on a month by month basis, we, our current ordinance also allows for quarterly billing if a, uh, customer wants to set it up their, uh, billing cycle up that way. So the amendment simply just removes the annual billing piece, removes the uh, everything going to uh, collections through the, the county, more than willing to look at it as an option in the future. But I think right now we have to treat everyone the same until we're able to try and find a way to reckon, to, to treat uh, commercial and residential properties uh, equally. Okay. Any questions or comments? I, I got a comment too. Um, just in regards to, we're not striking the part about where um, if someone was able, wasn't able to pay the trash bill that the city would have the ability to put a lien on their property. No, the city currently has that ability now. Mm -hmm. So just, just to um, piggyback on um, Councilman Major's um, amendment in regards to removing the annual billing. Um, I know we heard um, testimony from our um, city treasurer in regards to the potential um, revenue, that, revenue that could lead to the city. Um, currently our rate's at 89%. Um, so with any type of collections, our, the goal is to get 100%. Um, that's, it's a fair, you know, it's a fair way. You know, everyone should pay their share and anytime you fall short on the, those revenues, um, you know, sometime that could potentially in the long term provide um, hardship to, to the user who are paying or it's a missed opportunity for revenue that could be applied to other places. Um, I think from my perspective, in regards to how we're going about um, this change, there's a couple ways we can do, a couple ways the city can look at to um, increase, their, increase their collection rate. There's, there's different ways. Um, I know one way could be the way that's being proposed where, you know, in correlation, they, you know, we're basing upon the fact of saying that, hey, you know, uh, within our real estate tax, um, they have a per higher percentage of collection in, compares in comparison to what we do in our trash. So let's assert that um, collection rate to the way we're collecting our trash. But I think there is some um, anomalies where um, one, there is um, currently properties which we're addressing within this ordinance that are vacant, that are receiving trash bills that, we're, that people are not paying on it, that we're not accounting for within that 11% um, 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 number that we're trying to um, get to or is, and get to 100% compliance. There's also in regards to the relation of the missed revenue, um, which if we're billing um, for 20 million a year and we're saying we're only getting 18, that two million that we're missing, one thing we're not talking about is we're, this ordinance only talks about residential and doesn't um, necessarily talk about commercial. So we don't know the, what the potential 
revenue for residential by attaching it to the annual billing. Um, um, in defense, you know, any money that we're not receiving could be money that could be used. I think um, there are ways that we can kind of really shore up to kind of figure out what those numbers are um, to make sure that the process that we are going down is a process that's going to, um, you know, protect our residents. We know we had we had a lot of, of we had three public meetings and that was an overwhelming amount of uh, public conversation of concerns about switching to not just switching to annual billing, but switching to annual billing in relation to it being on the real estate taxes. Some of the proposals that people talked about, they said, hey, you know, maybe it's not the issue of the annual billing part, but being attached to the taxes is the issue that people talked about. They also proposed different ideas where, I know when we talked about um, the amount of time that it takes for the treasurer's office to prepare billings when it's monthly. Um, I know um, private um, haulers, they have um, quarterly billing. So that's the, one, that's the one way that we can kind of reduce the time in regards to us preparing um, monthly billing is the city could evaluate currently um, going to a quarterly system. And then if people prefer to receive a monthly billing, maybe they opt into that. So there's different ways that we can look for efficiency as far as time within the treasurer's office. Um, but I think we, before we go out putting numbers of the potential revenue that we're, that we're missing in regards to that we could possibly get, um, I think we should um, have a little bit more facts behind those numbers so we're not uh, misleading the, the public in regards to what potentially we can collect um, if we were to make just a change to the residential part of this bill. So that's why uh, we'll we be voting to support amending the bill to remove the annual billing. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any other questions or comments? Uh, I have a Mr. brief Matt. comment. Yeah. Uh, one thing I liked about the provision I think is important as a former uh, revenue agent at the Commonwealth, uh, I've noticed that government, when it comes to collections, can be quite antiquated. Uh, I spent a lot of time at the state taking and opening envelopes, putting checks, and then processing them. And that takes up an enormous amount of time. So one of the things I liked about this is switching over to an annual billing is, is that it, I think, eliminates that inefficiency. Um, so it's just something as we move forward, as we consider, we look at models that I do like. One of the things I just want to highlight that I did like is that it, it, to me it would be much more efficient and staff could use more time doing other things beyond just opening up mass amounts of checks every month. Um, but with that, I do want to say that I, tying it to Act 47, I think we do have to look at sort of things like this. Uh, I know we're in some uncharted uh, territory in terms of what we're going to be provided by the state uh, when they give their report, but I think something like this that gives uh, residents options and hopefully can allow staff to use their time a little bit, uh, I believe, smarter, is, uh, those are the types of policies that I think we should start looking at. But I do understand if uh, my colleagues do want to take more time to review uh, models and uh, different types of uh, billing systems. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes, and well, I'll just say to that point, uh, Councilman Madsen, we haven't received our Act 47 plan yet. Uh, we know that it, if, it, if, we, if, it is, if we are provided an extension, we have three years uh, to look at coming out. Um, so again, if our Act 47 plan, the plan comes back on July 9th and they're looking for us to find additional ways to increase revenue, which I'm sure they will be, and we want to explore this in the future, I am not proposed, opposed to, to doing so. Uh, again, this would just give us a little bit more time to uh, ensure that, you know, we can find a way to treat both residential and commercial uh, property owners uh, evenly how we handle this. So I'd, uh, again, ask for support of this amendment. Okay. Here another discussion. Please call the vote. Call this uh, series of amendments, amendment number two. Um, Mr. Allen? No. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Uh, no. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. The amendment carries. Yeah. And uh, one additional amendment. So I guess, Neil, well, all right. Uh, so on line 830, where we struck commercial property owners will be billed.
because that's under it's under the whole billing accounts. That was that was that was striking line eight twenty six and eight twenty seven. Okay, so was. under there would add a uh, oh. This is your third amendment. Yes. Okay. So we added that. It, it wouldn't have to be numbered. It, okay. So we'll just add language there. Um, that would, hold on, no, no strike that, I apologize. Uh, so under D, billing accounts, um, I guess I have line 801 is the last line where it says property involved. Yes. Okay. Um, so we'd add an, uh, another line saying that the director of public works shall cause an annual report to be issued to council summarizing the prior year billing history and account status. Uh, this is a amendment seeking to just in general terms provide a report to council regarding the uh, the, the status of, of bills. We we through this process. Uh, we looked in and saw that there are delinquent bills owed to the city of Harrisburg. I just want to ensure that council is getting that on an annual basis so we understand what the, uh, the information is in, as a public record. It doesn't have to have any identifying information, but this would just note how much residential, how much commercial, how many uh, dumpsters, and what their, uh, what any, what their billing stat history is. So it would note what we are billing, what uh, is paid in what would be owed to the city of Harrisburg. So that's your third amendment? Yes. So that's okay. amendment that sentence he okay. And what line is it on the, the first bill? What line is it on here? It's, well, it's going to go, it's going to continue line 801. There's two words on line 801. So it'll be the next sentence added after the end of the 801. Okay. Okay, I have a second. Second. Questions, comments on the third amendment? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. That concludes my amendment. Mr. Majors, may I just ask just a point of clarification? Uh, so it, it's my understanding from the amendment that you do not want the enforcement of the fines to start before January 1st. Um, are you certain? So I think you had amended it to. Yeah, okay. Well. Now that, now that annual billing is out, perhaps right. you'd like the rest of the. Yeah. So, yeah, no, with, with the annual billing piece out, I think we're, yeah. Yeah, that language was added at the end. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that language was a part of the annual billing discussion. So I may have taken those amendments out of order, so I apologize. So um, I guess that was a part of Amendment 2. And that was the, uh, I have beginning on line 1365. So excuse me, sorry, because of my numbers, I apologize. So uh, I guess this will be Amendment 4, and it would now strike. So technically, this would be a motion. A motion. Prior All right. motion to strike the addition to 1361 regarding the effective date of, of January. Okay. So I am going to make a motion to amend my motion to amend bill to striking lines 1361 beginning at is it is striking line 1361 following which reads it is the intent of council of the council of the city of Harrisburg that this ordinance take effect on January 1 2019.
So what, what are you amending it to? What are so you amending it to? We are going to this. This would so the amendment would strike that provision completely. This was I, I was looking to add this with the the potential of the annual billing going into effect, so it would not be in effect until January 1 of 2019. This would remove that with the annual billing piece not included, so that all of the f increase to the changes in the fines and penalties would be effective uh, in accordance with the law, so. Okay. Second. I have a second. Any questions or comments on the amendment? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Okay. Moving on to Bill 4, 2018. <clears throat> Bill 4 of 2018 was moved by Mr. Majors. That's the amendment. That's the amendment. We'll move on to the next one. Goes back. Goes okay, fine. We're going to do it in the back, final passage. Go ahead. Bill 4 of 2018 was moved by Mr. Major, second by Mr. Madsen. It's an ordinance amending Part 5 of Title II. The codified ordinance of the City of Harrisburg entitled Environmental Advisory Council to establish terms of the service and the process for appointing the initial and succeeding members of the Reorganized Environmental Advisory Council, EAC, <coughs> to increase the number of members of the EAC to permit the participation of non-voting city personnel and officials in the EAC board matters. Okay, Mr. Majors, do you have an amendment to uh, Bill 4? Yes, I do, and I promise this will go, this will, this amendment, I have one amendment and that is it. So the amendment is to line 55. Uh, the language currently reads that each initial member of the reorganized EAC shall be appointed otherwise approved and otherwise approved by city council by resolution in a manner consistent with the rules of council for a three-year term, for a term of three years. Thereafter, all appointees shall be nominated by the remaining members of the EAC for approval, <coughs> excuse me, by city council for a term of three years unless otherwise removed. Uh, the language, so the amendment would remove that and I would like the language to read as follows. So each initial member of the reorganized EAC shall be appointed <coughs> by the mayor and council and shall be chosen, uh, excuse me, shall be appointed by, sorry, I got, shall be appointed by the, mem by the mayor and council. Three initial appointments by the mayor and four shall be chosen four members shall be chosen by council. Thereafter, well, excuse me, for a term of three years. Thereafter, mayoral appointments shall be made by the mayor and councilmatic appointments shall be made by city council for a term of three years unless otherwise removed. I read that correctly, Wes. All right. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Is there, may I have a second, please? Second. Is there any questions or comments on the motion? Please call the vote, Mr. Petrowski. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you. Moving on to Bill 16, 2018. Oh, we don't have to do Bill 16 since we already we're voted. We're voted. We're okay. Right. Lord, this for final passage, Bill 3, 2018, as amended. Any questions or comments? Please uh, read in. Uh, do I need to read, for him to read that back in? Yeah, I just have to read. There's a new, there was a change to yes, the caption. Yes, as amended. Okay. So Bill 3 of 2018 as amended is an ordinance 
amending the reorganized part three of Title IX of the codified ordinances of the City of Harrisburg entitled the Municipal Waste and Recycling Code to reflect enhancements to the City's collection and management of solid waste, recycle and composting materials to identify prohibited acts which constitute violations of this code and to strengthen enforcement of this code by authorizing the use of enforcement officers to, officers to establish fines and penalties for violations of this code. Okay. Questions or comments on the, the uh, bill? Just want to make a brief comment. Uh, first, again, I want to start by thanking the public for all their input at our three public meetings that we had throughout the city of Harrisburg. All of your input was very important. Um, goal is to provide our, our public works department that does outstanding work with more tools in their toolkit to ensure that we are able to keep the streets of the city of Harrisburg clean. Um, you know, again, the goal is not to rifle through everyone's trash to determine if you, hey, you left one bottle and you put one bottle in the wrong container. This, the goal really is to be able to provide them with a the tool to go after our repeat violators uh, who are illegally dumping in the city of Harrisburg, have an excessive accumulation of waste, and really just aren't following the spirit of the rules for our sanitation. Uh, the, our folks do a, a great job of uh, working to keep the, the city clean, and we need to provide them with these tools to ensure that they're able to continue their work and uh, do what's best for the residents of Harrisburg. Uh, with respect to uh, removing the, the annual billing piece. Again, I will reiterate, uh, we are, uh, my goal really is to ensure that everyone is treated fairly, uh, how, how this process goes. It's not, I understand the, the financial uh, implications of Act 47, and we'll see what our plan says on July 9th, but the goal right now is to treat both residential and commercial uh, property owners fairly in the city of Harrisburg. In addition, um, we heard from, I've, I've, been, I've received emails and I know our, our public works folks have been dealing with billing issues with vacant properties. Again, this, if you are a owner of a vacant lot or a vacant property, uh, this provides you with an opportunity to certify with our public works department who you are and that you are certifying that said property is vacant. Uh, and you will not receive a trash bill but you will still be responsible for any accumulation that would, were to occur on your property. Uh, so with that, um, I would again ask my council members for an affirmative vote. Thank you. Any question or comment on the amended Bill 3? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allen? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Bill 3 as amended passes. Thank you. Moving on to Bill 4, 2018. Uh, Bill 4 of 2018, as amended, was moved by Mr. Major, second by Mr. Madsen. Or, it's an ordinance amending Part 5. Title 2 of the codified ordinances of the City of Harrisburg entitled Environmental Advisory Council to establish terms and service in the process for appointing the initial and succeeding members of the organized Environmental Advisory Council EAC to in increase the number of members of the EAC and to permit the participation of non-voting city personnel and officials in EAC board matters. Mr. Majors, uh, comment? Well, no. Okay. Uh, President William, I don't know if you had a comment from. No, I don't. Okay. Any questions or comments? Please call the vote. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Bill 4, as amended, passes. Thank you. Moving on to resolutions. And before we, I, we move on, I, I do want to say thank you, Mr. Majors, for all your input and your hard work trying to make sure that we uh, are in agreement with the passage of Bill 3 and Bill 4 as well. Moving on to Resolution for Resolution 70 of 2018. Resolution 70 of 2018 was moved by Ms. Williams, seconded by Mr. Allen. That's a resolution of the Council of the City of Harrisburg ratifying the 2018 to 2022 basic labor agreement between the City of Harrisburg the local union number 428 international association of firefighters i have a brief summary of resolution 70 by mr jack dean thank you uh good evening and good evening. Uh, hope everybody has a happy and safe fourth i will give you a brief summary of this uh, contract for those of you who remember me i was here before you for the fop contract maybe a year and a half ago uh maybe a little less uh and what we did was 
for the first time since 2002, negotiate a full contract with the uh, firefighters. What I can say before I get into the summaries uh, of the highlights of the changes is that the, co the contract negotiations with the firefighters were professional, cordial, they were very responsive, uh, they recognized, this, uh, they recognized uh, the city's status. We, entered, we finalized an agreement after extensive negotiation sessions. The city solicitor, the chief of police, and the firefighters worked hard to take a book, which, as you know, contained multiple referrals. When you had the first, you, you could not automatically result uh, by review of a provision by reading one provision of a contract. You had to bounce back and forth between a 2002 contract, a First Amendment in 09, an 08 arbitration award. What we have, what the city has put together, is one book of a contract. So, and it's a five-year deal. So, that, uh, city firefighters will have labor stability for five years. Uh, the chief is very pleased with it. Uh, the firefighters, my understanding, uh, are very pleased with it. And again, I can't emphasize um, enough the fact how the firefighters uh, team worked with us to put uh, this together. Uh, the highlights are, again, it's a five-year contract. Uh, the new contract will provide compensation based salary increases effective, it's 2% a year for five years. However, the 2018 provision does not become effective until July 1st uh, of 2018. So it's effectively a split raise. They have their Great. same salary for the first half of the year second half of the year, they'll have a 2% raise. Okay. Uh, the subsequent four years are 2% each year. Uh, this was shared with the Act 47 coordinator back in February uh, before we put the final version of the agreement together. The reason it took a little while, there were 40 MOUs over the mm -hmm. last 16 years that we had to either incorporate or determine with the firefighters are no longer applicable. So it took a long time not only to go through that, but to incorporate those into a document that, that, that um, we could work with. Uh, a new provision, which is now Article 10, Section 4, pro similar to the fire uh, police, which I was here on before, provides that we're, we're concerned mainly more with the police who were, but also with firefighters, of keeping them here when they start, because we invest money in them. So we have a new onboarding provision, which provides that should the firefighter elect to leave before his or her fifth anniversary, uh, they'll reimburse uh, the city of Harrisburg $5,000 representing the cost of training. Okay. Uh, Article 12, Section 4, just a, uh, uh, we, li we eliminated the alert status. Neither the firefighters nor the administration uh, understood what the provision meant. It was a holdover from prior to 2002. Uh, both parties agreed just to eliminate that provision. It was just a, a, a cleanup. Uh, clothing and equipment allowance, Article 13. Uh, the firefighters have agreed to uh, return their last set of equipment to the city of Harrisburg without compensation upon their separation of employment. Currently, they get reimbursed for that. So that's a cost savings to the city. Okay. Uh, we also insert a language at the suggestion of the firefighters that we will open our, our gear purchases to multiple vendors. Uh, to see to ensure that we can get the best price and the best equipment for our firefighters. Uh, as to insurance, again, just to clean up, uh, we're always looking to get, have the most cost-effective and fair insurance for our firefighters. So we insert a language in Article 15 that says a committee is going to be formed between the firefighters and the administration that will meet once a year to look at possible changes in health care and ways uh, we can save money or provide better health care. Uh, an important provision uh, is now under Article 18. Currently, firefighters who opt out of our insurance policy receive 60% buyout for not taking our insurance. Uh, the firefighters have agreed to reduce that to 30% of the health insurance costs. Uh, Probationary period, again, Article 21, language cleanup. Currently, the practices under our MOUs is, is one year. In the contract, it said six months, so we just cleaned that up to one year. Okay. Uh, IOD status, Article 27, Section 3. Uh, if a firefighter is out in excess of two days, a doctor's excuse must be provided. Currently, it is four days. 
So uh, if they're out more than two days, they have to bring a doctor's excuse. We deleted some language uh, regarding the term physician. The term physician previously included a licensed chiropractor. It no longer does. Uh, we also determined, we also inserted language that the, uh, in Article 27, Section 3, that administration can review to make sure that IOD status and sick leave is not being abused. And if it is, uh, a firefighter could be subject to disciplinary action. Right now, we don't think that's a problem, but it's sort of a prophylactic approach going forward. Uh, Article 33, Section 5, manpower, uh, slightly revised. Minimum manning is 15 firefighters with one command officer uh, with captains being counted towards the 15. Uh, and very important, this was very important to the firefighters. They want, and it's important to, to it, was, it was actually important to administration also, so it was pretty easy to agree on, is that uh, all three fire stations will have at least one supervisor on duty. Uh, when a lieutenant is acting as a captain, uh, that'll count towards the minimal manning of 15. The minimal manning of 15 does not increase minimal manning technically. Right now it's 14, but because we're gonna have a command officer counting towards minimal manning, it, it, does, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't increase our language. Uh, incentive pay, Article 6, Section 9A, uh, this was revised for firefighters taking additional courses. We're giving them a flat fee uh, of 300 for an associate's degree, 600 for a bachelor's, and 1,000 for a master's. That's similar, that, that's not, that, that's similar uh, a cost to what we're doing now, but right now we're paying by credit, and sometimes from an administrative standpoint, that becomes an accounting nightmare, uh, so that uh, our administration can focus on other things, and the firefighters will still get their same uh, amount of pay for taking advanced degrees. Uh, we increased our, uh, some lang we inserted some language that the firefighters will increase uh, their uh, uh, excess work pay from 250 a year to 750 per year. That only applies to four firefighters. So it's a, it's a minimal charge, but it gives firefighters uh, a little extra incentive and a little extra pay for doing some work around uh, during their hours. The other increase was we in, we're giving four firefighters $750 a year to perform small engine uh, repairs and four firefighters $750 a year to perform hot hose and nozzle maintenance. Uh, we anticipate that one, again, that'll give firefighters some, in, not incentive, I don't think they need incentive to work on their equipment, but it gives them some reward for working on their equipment and will save us hopefully some funds not sending small engines out. We have firefighters who are well equipped to handle that thing. Uh, and finally, we inserted two new articles. Uh, one is Article 30, Section 2, which provides that we're going to keep firefighters abreast of any proposed agreements with municipalities to provide other municipalities with fire suppression services. Uh, right now, there's nothing in the works to my knowledge, but if there are, we're going to let them know and let them work with us. And I think that's the spirit of cooperation that led to this agreement. Uh, and finally, again, with the spirit of cooperation, on a voluntary basis, uh, if firefighters elect to have PAC donations deducted from their paychecks, uh, the city has agreed to do that, but they have to be identified by the firefighters and signed off by a specific firefighter. That was at their request. We thought it was a reasonable request, and it is a legal request. Yeah. That, that's the highlights, and I know I sped through them. Uh, you guys have the contract. If you have any questions, I'm here to answer whatever questions you have. But I will say this. Again, I can't reiterate how, what a pleasure it was to work with the firefighters. This is a fiscally responsible contract that will give labor stability for the city of Harrisburg, for its taxpayers, and for its firefighters, most importantly, in this contract for the next five years. Okay. <clears throat> Seeing that they get uh, their 2% and it starts July 1st, which is the other day, Yes. So they're going to be retroactive for the July 1st? They're going to pay? Re retroactive for one Because we're day. not in that pay period. That, that's okay. correct. Okay. All right. And what was it originally for the health insurance if they didn't take it? Was it 60 or 70? It was said? 60. I'm sorry. So now it's 30. 30. Okay. Okay. So you pay them 30%? Pay them 30%. Yeah. And, and interestingly enough, I was actually at a meeting the other day on, on health care buybacks. And 
there is a, there is a medium for it. There is a, there is a number that works, and we right. uh, we think thirty percent will work. So what are we looking at per per fighter? What is that amount? What does uh, that amount to? I have to? to check what our annual equivalent premium is at this time. It depends on family plan. Okay. Whatever plan they're eligible for, uh, we know a gross number that we anticipate reduction, uh, which allowed us the two percent salary increase okay. uh, to comply with Act Forty Seven. Uh, if I recall correctly, and again, this is, uh, I don't have the numbers, if, if Bruce has the numbers on what our equivalent premium is for a family plan, 30% uh, of a family plan is probably around $6,000 a year. So that's, a, that's about where a, a good medium falls, that the firefighter will opt out if he has the ability to have his health insurance elsewhere. Okay. Um, then you said there's going to be a committee between firefighters and administration to discuss the health pro plan? Yeah, no, yeah if, if every year, I mean, I, we, you know what the, the, the age we live in, health things are changing every day on a nationwide basis. We can't change their health care plan absent agreement from them. Right. So this, this incentivizes both the administration and the firefighters that if either side sees an ability, uh, uh, I, and I, I look at things like that, that I've seen change, higher plan deductibles, uh, self-funded deductibles. If we make those changes, or, see, or if the administration determines a change such as that, would possibly benefit the city while not impacting the firefighters or slightly impacting the firefighters, we would meet with them to discuss that and hopefully come to an agreement uh, that would be mutual, mutually agreed. I, I'm the reason I'm concerned about that because uh, aren't we on a contractual agreement, Mr. Weber, with the it's, see, being self-insured? Aren't we on a contractual agreement with our health? Yeah, can we can we change it in midstream like that? Uh, th that is not the intention. Okay. The intention is that we meet with the brokers every year. We have quarterly meetings. We cover. They always have proposals of things to change. Okay, and then it, so, so it's open to and so yes, yeah, so they can see what what, what that is and okay. see whether that's a good idea or not. Some right. of them are good ideas and some of them aren't. Right, and the brokers right. are usually the ones that bring the ideas to us, frankly, okay. that say, hey, how about this, how about that? Because they deal with a thousand municipalities and we're dealing with a, with a handful usually. Okay. That's all the questions there. Anyone else have any questions? Mr. Madsen? Yeah, I guess the question here is for the chief. Um, what's been the overall response from the rank and file? Are they excited about it? Are they yeah, I, you know, again, uh, going back, uh, this is the first negotiated contract that we've been able to bring uh, forth since 2002, and I think that's huge. Uh, I believe that the firefighters are, are in favor of it. Is there some grumbling? There, there's always going to be grumbling. You know, that is what it is. You're always, you can't please everybody. But, uh, you know, it, it uh, was voted on and was approved by the membership. Um, you know, thus we're, we're pretty happy with that, that, you know, we do have the support of the, of the firefighters. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Dean, and thank you, Chief. Thank you. Again, have a, a great holiday. And, and I'm pretty happy with that thank you. contract. It sounds very, yeah, very good. I, I think, I think yes. they did yes. a great job. I, yeah. think, I, they, I would agree. Hats off to the Chief, Deal, and the firefighters. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Here are no other questions or comments. Please call the vote, Mr. Petrosky, on Resolution 70. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Yes. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 70 passes. Thank you. Moving on to Resolution 71. Resolution 71 of 2018 was moved by Ms. Williams, seconded by Mr. Allett. It's a resolution confirming the appointment of Jane Bucklock to serve on the Alert Up Fields Board. Any questions or comments on Resolution 71? Hearing none, please call the vote. Mr. Allett? Yes. Ms. Daniels? Same objections as last time and now. That no? Um, we assume it's, I think she said same as no. Okay. Ms. Ms. Green? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Mr. Madsen? Yes. Mr. Majors? Yes. Ms. Williams? Yes. Resolution 71 passes. And, and just let me let the public know, um, Resolution 71 is an appointment that was given to the, uh, that was sent to the city of Harrisburg by the Harrisburg School Board for their appointment on the Lerner Appeals Board. And each of the designated um, entities has an appointment, the city, the state, and the county. 
and I'm sorry, the city, the, the school district, and the county. And that was their appointment, and we have no um, decision to uh, who they appoint on that board or not. So uh, Ms. Daniels is concerned about that individual not coming before this council and being interviewed as a prospective appointee on that board. But uh, even if she does so, we are just a confirmation and we are, according to the old ordinance that we have, we had to confirm that vote by the Harrisburg School District. Moving on to old business, is there any old business, Ms. Council members? New business council members, Mr. Matson. Yeah. Are you sure? Yeah. Okay. No, new I, business? I, I I'm sorry, uh, Mr. Johnson and then Mr. Ann. Um, first thing is, um, I wanna just thank everyone for a good first half of the year. Um, you know, I really, really, I've been third year on council, I really, really enjoyed my time here on council. Um, even coming straight from work with my Hershey Park shirt. Um, mm -hmm. I think we do um, amazing things and we're really truly here to serve um, the public. I think there are some challenging days ahead for the city as we figure out this um, Act 47 in our three-year plan. I know there's a, a lot of talk on different things that we're trying to do. We're looking forward to seeing the actual plan um, from the um, coordinator's office on July 9th to kind of see what that roadmap looks like. Um, going back to a point a resident made today in regards to our current, current taxing, um, taxing um, that we have in place in regards to the EIT and LST, um, I think she does bring up a good point about um, making sure we are putting the education out there to, to, for residents to understand why we currently need to keep those taxes because to her point, originally these were um, thought to be temporary, um, which the law calls for them to say that they're temporary in regards to being Act 47 status. Um, but the implications, if we don't keep them, could mean that um, we have to resort to other options in regards to um, looking at raising our real estate taxes, which can further burden our, our residents even more. So I think it's a huge, huge part throughout this process. And I know we are continuously trying to do that, that we're emphasizing um, the true options um, to our residents to understand um, what and why the city, uh, what the city is fighting for and trying to accomplish in order to um, move forward to financial stability. Um, also wanted to wish everyone a nice, safe summer. Um, make sure um, nonviolent, keep it peaceful. Um, we do have a pool open at Hall Manor. Um, I did talk to Kevin today and they're looking to um, push for Jackson Lake to be open um, sometime soon. Um, so keep your um, fingers crossed on that. And I do want to announce an event um, that's going to be happening um, before um, we return back to the council. Um, the event is called um, The Weekender. It's going to be um, August 17th through 19th um, next month. Um, the major sponsors are the City of Harrisburg, um, Harrisburg Housing Authority, U UPMC Pinnacle, um, Singer's Lounge, and Levels Ready Entertainment, and many, many more. I'll um, just give you guys a brief highlight. Um, this is going to be an entire weekend event starting at Friday at the Harrisburg Housing Authority. Um, where they're, they're going to be hosting a community day at the Hall, Hall Manor Activities Field, which that would include a health fair, career and education fair, food and games, open mic, live music, and DJ. And that's open to the entire city of Harrisburg. And then on that Saturday, August 18th, from 12 to 8, um, it's going to be the Harrisburg Music Festival at the Reservoir Park Bandshell, um, where we'll be featuring um, some Region, national, regional, and local artists to include um, acts such as DJ Diamond Cuts, um, Tobe Nagobi, um, Sarak, Saraya, um, local talents such as Cordell, Genius, Rel, Joey Costar. Um, so that should be an exciting day inside the park. And then on that Sunday, um, we'll start off the day um, at 9 a.m. with a um, three on three basketball tournament um, hosted at um, our Reservoir Park basketball courts. And then um, around four o'clock that evening, um, we'll kick off what is known as the Singer's Lounge Family Cookout, um, which is um, put on by the Singer's Lounge, which currently holds their events at um, HMAC, for those who are familiar. 
but um, they will be having it at the park with a special guest per performer, um, Little Mo. Um, so throughout um, Saturday and Sunday, there will be food, there will be vendors, um, there will be um, a school supply giveaway. Um, so a lot of exciting things going on during that weekend. Um, there's a lot of hard people at work trying to make this weekend happen. And the best part about it, everything is completely free. So I invite every one of our residents and people in the surrounding areas to attend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Is there any other new business? Mr. Allen. Yeah, I just wanted to make the administration aware. I got a phone call today from a resident in Harrisburg concerned about um, behavior in and around the Hall Manor pool. I'm just hoping we can ensure that we enforce both the rules in and around the pool and make sure that it maintains a safe place, particularly I think as we wait for Jackson Lake to open, um, to make sure that not only everyone can have access to a safe and um, good environment to be in. So just wanted to kind of share that with the administration. Okay. That's all. Any other new business? Okay. Hearing that, I just want to wish everybody a happy 4th of July and also a safe and enjoyable summer. And the Harrisburg City Council will see everybody back here August 28th, 2018 at uh, 530. Thank you. We have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Uh, meetings adjourned. <laughs>